This is Democracy Now! I'm Amy Goodman with Juan Gonzalez as we continue to look at the coronavirus pandemic spike here in the U.S. and how the vaccine will be distributed as the CDC prepares to meet today to vote on who should be the first to get the vaccine once it's available. As distribution draws near, a recent poll suggests 42 percent of Americans are reluctant to take the vaccine. In response, some, including the former Maryland congressman and former presidential candidate John Delaney are pushing to pay people to get vaccinated. This is Delaney on CNN responding to criticism that the pl plan would cause an undue burden on people who are economically disadvantaged. Those who are at least economically so among us have suffered disproportionately under this pandemic. So many of those people are not sitting at home and zooming into work. They're actually getting on public transportation, going to grocery stores, and making sure the essential things that we all need are available. They're the people who will benefit the most from getting the vaccination rate up. Well, for more on vaccine distribution, we're joined by Dr. Monica Peake, a physician, associate professor of medicine and health disparities researcher at the University of Chicago. Uh, she is meeting at the university today to determine how the university will roll out the vaccine there. In Chicago, like other cities across the country, those killed by COVID-19 have been disproportionately African American and Latinx. Dr. Peak, welcome to Democracy Now. It's great to have you with us. Why don't you start off by responding to what the former congressman is proposing? Um, if there is a problem with people being concerned about the vaccine, pay them to take it. No. Um I agree with Dr. Purcell in that we should separate the two issues of economic need and the issue of vaccine implementation, um, because we don't want the perception of vaccine safety um, and trust in the vaccine to um, cloud the waters of economic need. And so um, it is really important that people are able to look at the science, that people are able to follow uh, the words of the scientists and the public health professionals and say, this is something that is safe that I believe in, that, that the trusted professionals are recommending that I take, and that they're not saying this is something that financially I need to do. And I think there might be more risks associated with it because I'm having to be paid to take it. But because I'm so broke, I'm going to put my body in harm's way in order to get this money. We don't want people feeling like they have to make that choice. So we need to be able to, to disentangle those two things um, and, and make sure that we have given the people the stimulus that they need. Those conversations are in gridlock. That needs to, you know, uh, fix itself. Um, we need to come to agreement about how to make sure that we are um, financially supporting the people that are in this economic crisis. Separately, we need to figure out how we're going to be able to um, ensure that we have the trust needed to vaccinate our entire U.S. population. Everyone's got to get vaccinated quickly. And so those are two separate conversations. And on this issue, Dr. Peek, of the uh, getting everyone vaccinated, clearly there will have to be steps and the, the decisions that are being made uh, today in terms of priorities at the federal level. How does this, even at your university or at the local level, how do the health professionals, what kind of things do they think about in terms of after the, the, the first responders, the people in the healthcare system, who gets it next? Well, you know, there are millions of people uh, that need this vaccine. And so um, a lot of thought has been going into how to fairly allocate uh, the vaccine um, way before we knew that the vaccines would even be ready. So it's a miracle that it's uh, we have two that are, are coming on the market this quickly. 
Um, and so the National Academy of Science, Engineering, and Medicine had been meeting already for months and has come up with recommendations. The, um, the CDC is currently meeting. Um, individual hospitals are coming up with their with their individual rollout plans. But the general consensus um, is that people who are frontline workers, people who are considered frontline healthcare workers, high-risk healthcare workers, people who are essential workers, those who are sick, have chronic medical problems, those who are living in close quarters, congregate facilities like nursing homes, um, homeless shelters, prisons, um, people that are elderly, all of these sort of high-risk populations for whatever reason, um, based on your job, where you're living, how sick you are, those are the populations um, that need to be vaccinated early. Um, K through 12 teachers, um, we need to be able to get people back into school, into settings where they can be close together. Um, and so there's a phased rollout uh, where we have, you know, a phase one, a phase two, a phase three, so that we can sort of in an orderly fashion <laughs> figure out who's going to go first um, and ultimately get to make sure that everyone in the population goes. And so right now we're trying to think about just phase 1A, um, which is high risk health workers um, and uh, first responders. And so... Um, Assuming that things happen on time and December 10th, the first vaccine is made available and starts being shipped out, then the hospitals are beginning to look inwardly and think about how we're going to uh, vaccinate our own hospital employee population. So where I am, we have about 6,500 employees, a little more than that. Um, and so we think that we can vaccinate everybody in a week. So if we did a thousand vaccinations a day, um, then we could get everyone done within a week's time. And so uh, we are sort of looking at that kind of time frame. And when we talk about, for instance, uh, first uh, res uh, responders and, and folks in healthcare facilities, I'm assuming that, for instance, in a hospital that includes not just the nurses and the doctors and the uh, but also the, the maintenance staff and the kitchen workers and all the other people that are part of that hospital complex. Is that true? That is true. Everybody in the hospital um, is potentially exposed. And um, we think about when you are a patient in the hospital, someone is coming in to clean your room. Someone is coming in to deliver your food. Someone's coming in to take your temperature. Um, there are many people that come in and out of that door, uh, deliver magazines, um, who are not your nurse or your physician, but have contact with you. Um, there are people who are changing your bed linens um, and that are, you know, having contact with soiled, contaminated, infectious products. And so everybody needs to be uh, protected. We are all in this together. And so um, the hospital is is a bubble that that um, we're all in and we are all at risk. And so yes, uh, hospital workers means all hospital workers. As we were just talking with uh, Dr. Chris Purnell about the use of experimentation, especially on the African-American community, medical experimentation, one of your specialties is racial disparities. And I had two questions. This isn't related just to disparities. You said everyone could be vaccinated in a week, but these are a two-part vaccine. So there's mm -hmm. this question of, um, will they— use all the 40 million or so vaccines all at w once and then wait for the next ones to be developed? Or will they only use 20 million of them so you can get the second vaccine in whatever that period is? And if you can talk about whether it conveys immunity or you can actually get sick, but you uh, will be asymptomatic and you can still spread it, all these questions about the vaccine. But then also, in the wider population, since that's what you deal with also outside of the University of Chicago, um, workers at the meatpacking plants, farm workers, people who are undocumented, how do we ensure that they all have equal access? 
These are excellent questions um, and, and difficult questions, but ones that we are going to have to think about um, how we have a system in place to roll out implementation. And so it, already it, it shows that this is not something that hospitals in and of themselves are going to do. The vaccines are primarily going to be shipped to health departments. Um, and then health departments then parcel them out to different institutions. And so in some cases, um, you know, hospitals will be working alongside other kinds of organizations to make sure that populations are effectively vaccinated. And so certainly we are used to caring for patients. And so we'll be, you know, caring for our own patients um, who are medically vulnerable and making sure that they get vaccine, vaccinated. But some people, not everyone has a, a primary care physician. Many people exist, um, unfortunately, without routine care. But we need to make sure that everyone in this country is vaccinated. And so we're going to have to think about non-healthcare sites for vaccination, just like we're doing for COVID testing, where we have pop-up um, testing sites. We're gonna have to be more creative in how we think about reaching populations that don't ordinarily show up at our doors for care um, and to in ensure that we are reaching everyone for vaccine delivery. And, and Dr. Peek, I wanted to ask you, given the fact that the vaccine will be rolled out probably right around the time that the deaths and the hospitalizations from the virus are, are, are at record levels. There's going to be enormous pressure uh, by sectors of the population to get the vaccine. Uh, I'm thinking there's over the last nine months, there's a whole section of the American public that has had the ability to work remotely from home and therefore protect themselves, whereas those uh, uh, workers uh, who have to go to work every day have been increasingly the ones most exposed. So mm -hmm. shouldn't the, va the vaccine then be rolled out to those who are being forced to work every day as a result of the kind of jobs that they have? And won't there be pressure from those who are uh, generally more professional, more middle class, who are, have stayed at home all these nine months uh, to also get the vaccine? How do you monitor? Uh, what's going to be the monitoring process to make sure there's not abuses? Yeah, you know, that's an excellent question. Um, I am unaware of uh, sort of the teeth or the penalties for people jumping in line um, and trying to abuse the system. Um, but what we have tried to put in place are um, parameters um, and a, a rollout system so that, you know, think about a, a buffet line at, on a cruise ship or something. So now we're taking people who are having the, the blue the blue cards. These are the people who are due to get vaccinated. You know, this week we're doing everyone who's a healthcare employee. Next week we're doing, you know, essential workers for the next month. Um, and we've, how we're gonna figure out exactly how we find those people and, and whatever we're, you know, those are the plans and implementation policies and things we're going to have to be working through in conjunction with, you know, city planners. And, and this is where the rubber hits the road and all of the infrastructure and, and planning has to, you know, st start working and has been working. Um, but essential workers in, that are keeping our cities and townships functioning, um, they're high up on the list. They're part of the phase two. And so, um, again, people who are for, uh, performing uh, critical functions for the city, as well as people who are carrying higher burdens of disease, are priority people. Frequently, those are the same people, um, because um, people who have been burdened by oppression, um, by structural inequities and racism, um, that has affected their health. and the same structural inequities has meant that they have had limited opportunities as far as education and um, career advancement. So a lot of times they're more likely to be working in essential worker jobs. And so many of the people who um, that we're talking about being uh, high priorities for a medical reason or for an occupational reason 
are the same people. And so those people are, are, may have multiple reasons to be priority individuals for getting vaccinated. Um, and, Dr. Monica Peek, maybe we're getting ahead of ourselves here. I mean, you have Stephen Hahn, head of the FDA, the doctor who's been called to the White House because Mark Meadows, the chief of staff, who also came down with COVID, as did President Trump. Of course, the White House is a hot spot because of the herd immunity approach uh, President Trump has taken, uh, putting pressure on him to speed up the approval process. It's, it'll be going to the FDA, but then it has to be approved by the CDC. Um, mm -hmm. This has been done at unbelievable speed, which is both the excellent news, but also a concern for people. Um, is this being approved with the, um, with the kind of scientific review that something like this, distributed on a mass basis, needs? Um, are you concerned about that? Uh, overall, the speed with which this is being done, and mm -hmm. the fact that even before J January 20th, as everyone looks at that next inauguration day, you have tens of thousands of Americans who will die. And what President Trump needs to be doing right now outside the virus, uh, outside the vaccine, to ensure that people have access to masks and tests, something that continues to be a massive problem in this country. Yes. So much you just said right there. Um, so, where to start? Um, I, guess, I guess the easy answer is thinking about the current administration. Um, given that Trump has been in office for four years um, and we've seen what he can and cannot do, um, and we've seen how he has handled and approached the COVID pandemic. I don't have uh, high hopes that his behavior will change between now and, and January 20th. The, the best that I can hope for is that um, he will step out of the way um, in, in, in enough way to make room for the incoming Biden administration and the transition team to be able to um, make some headway. Biden has the first thing he did was pull together his COVID-19 task force, which is, you know, chocked full of scientists, health policy analysts, public health professionals, people who are very experienced in, you know, vaccine policy um, and know what they're doing. And so getting these people together who have already been thinking about COVID for years, well, not for years, but, you know, uh, inf infectious diseases for years and have been thinking about the COVID pandemic since it started, you know, that is where we need to be able to let uh, these people flourish in this space um, and have access to um, some resources. Um, but I do think that... Um, talking about just the, the, the rapidity with which these vaccines have moved forward. You're right in that that's a, it's a good thing. And then there's some ambivalence there. We want things to move as quickly as possible, as long as it's safe. Um, we want them to move with the speed of light as long as the science is there. Um, and for them not to have been politically approved, but for them to be a to have been scientifically approved. And so that's the fine line that we want to walk. And so um, when all the scientists and have come together behind the idea of, you know, Project Warp Speed, that has been so far an effective scientific endeavor. Um, and so we want that kind of scientific collaboration to continue. But what we don't want is politicians getting in the mix and saying, I really need this to happen to ensure my reelection or, you know, things that worry the public. And we know that these things have worried the public. And so we cannot undermine or we have already undermined. We cannot continue to undermine and erode the public trust in this process. We need to have the public trust that this vaccine will be safe. And we cannot cut corners um, because once the vaccine is here, if no one is willing to take it, all of this effort will have been for naught. So we, we, we can't, you know, 
speed things up just to get here and then no one's willing to use it. So we have to, as Dr. Purcell was saying, do the hard work. We have to do it right. We have to think right now in advance about how we're going to make this vaccine acceptable um, to communities who are thinking that this is something that I'm not interested in um, and be engaging right now in campaigns of truth telling. We have to be engaging with organizations that we know are trustworthy. Rather than tearing down the CDC, we need to be building up that public health infrastructure, reinvesting in the CDC, giving them back the leadership and the, the ability to tell truth to the public, and giving them back, you know, the right to, to run the ship. Dr. Monica um, Peak, I want to thank you so much for being with us. Physician, yeah. associate professor of medicine and health disparities research at the University of Chicago. There is so much to talk about, and we will get back to you soon. Um, again, next up, it's World AIDS Day. We'll speak with Professor Stephen Thrasher in 30 seconds.